So our next speaker this morning is renowned artist and stage designer S. Devlin. S. is known for creating large-scale performative sculptures and environments that fuse music, language and light. She's conceived stage sculpt uh, sculptures for Beyonce, uh, Billie Eilish, uh, The Weeknd and U2, and her practice was the subject of a Netflix documentary series, Abstract, The Art of Design. She's been named the Artistic Director of the 2021 London Design Biennale. Uh, S wasn't able to join us for this live broadcast, but uh, Wired Features Editor uh, Vicky Turk recorded a conversation with S a few days ago to discuss her approach to creativity, AI as a creative tool, and the future of live experiences. Let's see what they talked about. Please welcome S. Devlin in conversation with Wired's Vicky Turk. S, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Vicky. I'm excited to be here. So you make works that can take the form of huge sculptures or environments, blending architecture, sound, light, performance. How do you use technology in your work? Do you know what's quite interesting is the technology tends to be the last thing on my mind. Um, normally what I'm trying to do is tell a story uh, or express an idea or try to change people's minds about something or try to shift their perspective about something. Um, so I will tend to begin with the shape of an idea or a story or the rhythm of a story. Then I'll think about the time, how the time should be spent by the performers and by the audience or by the sculpted object in the audience who might perceive it. And I'll think about the geometry, the shape of it, the architecture of it, and the light and the dark of it. And finally, I'll want to find a piece of technology that can do what I need to do. For example, uh, not long ago, I, I had an idea that I wanted one and a half thousand people to co-compose a poem. Um, and of course, I wanted magic was what I really wanted. Normally, what I want is not technology, but magic. Uh, and I said, well, I, I want everyone to be able to donate a word and I want a poem to happen. I want magic to turn these donated one and a half thousand words into a poem. And so normally it's in my search to, for magic that very excellent people are introduced to me who turn out to have been engaged in this type of magic slash technology. Uh, and that's how um, I arrive at the technology I use, you, you know? So it, it's always to fulfill a need. So that's uh, your poem portraits work, which was using an algorithm to create poems out of those words uh, donated by people. Um, is, is that the first time you've used AI? Do you know, it, it is really, I mean, I say that, I think we are all using AI, aren't we? Every day and every minute and we're being used by AI. So I, I doubt it is the first time I've used AI at all, but it's the first time I tried to have some agency in my use of AI, I would say. Um, and it was with an extraordinary creative technologist called Ross Goodwin and later another phenomenal creative technologist called Kyle McDonald, who are now both heroes of mine uh, and what they've taught me about how the algorithms that can uh, generate poetry through machine learning work. And I guess the biggest piece of learning, um, you know, to me at the beginning, because I was uh, really looking for a solution to a problem, uh, I was delighted that, you know, poems emerge. In the first instance, the algorithm was trained on 19th century Victorian poetry. Um, and the poems that were created by it were rather beautiful. They were rather meditative. Um, and an audience's reaction to them was something like an audience's reaction to a fortune cookie. You know, you want to find meaning in it, right? So it was more reflective on the human species desire to find meaning than the ability of the algorithm to imbue something with meaning, I think, in the end, that version. However, um, this was for the Serpentine Gallery in 2016. Subsequently, we've been working on this algorithm now for four years and training it and retraining it and using more advanced um, uh, technology behind the actual algorithm itself. And the one that we're preparing now for the um, uh, UK Pavilion at the World Expo is remarkably more advanced in terms of the quality of its output. It's just remarkably more complex. Um, but what I've really learned is 
I hadn't taken into account the bias involved in, in the algorithm. I, it was one afternoon I was on a call with Kyle McDonald um, and he it was right in the middle of the Black Lives Matter moment when it had just begun. And he had been talking to his parents who were quite traditional in their approach to things in America. And he had become very disillusioned with our work. And he said, Ez, you must stop talking about this algorithm as if it's kind of nebulous. You must give it an identity. You must give it a biography. Because to not do that is to deny the fact that each of these algorithms comes from a specific group of people. And albeit the UK Pavilion album has been taught by a number of parents who come from a diverse range of backgrounds, purposefully chosen so. However, uh, I think he's quite right that we will serve ourselves well if we write biographies for our algorithms and recognize that each one has its specific viewpoint. That's really interesting. Um, you know, we hear a lot about uh, AI and creativity. You know, can AI truly be creative? How do we use it? Is it just a tool? Um, how do you approach it as a creative tool? I mean, do you see it as a tool or a co-creator or what is the role of artificial intelligence in the artistic sphere, do you think? Listen, I think that that question will be answered in many, many and broader and broader ways. There certainly is no single approach but in my own experience like I said my I, I didn't set out and say hey I want to explore working with AI that wasn't what happened it was more that I was um frustrated with the fact that uh, one and a half thousand people could be together and these particular one and a half thousand people who attend this particular evening gathering at the Serpentine temporarily extinct I might add but for years, uh, or mid-June, many of my heroes would gather. You know, it would be Zaha Hadid, David Ajay, John Pawson, Ron Arad. You know, the, the designers, the artists uh, would all converge to help support that gallery. And I, I wanted to know, was there a way that a free piece of art that everyone could take home for free could be generated by this entire collective um, I guess I was looking for a, a really smooth and fluid way for a bunch of humans to collaborate, right? Just by the pure act of donation of a word, just giving a word. So that's what I was looking for. Um, and I wouldn't have thought of machine learning. I wouldn't have thought of an algorithm. Um, but it was really Ross Goodwin who introduced me to the work he'd been doing for years. Um, and I guess... That then opened my mind to a, a collaboration that might be possible between the living and the dead. So the poets that we were collaborating with were long dead. They were poets of the 19th century who had written these words. And by training the algorithm, um, you know, you know, it works more or less like predictive text. You know, it's um, it's consuming so many uh, of these phrases that it begins to predict what word is going to come after the next one. And that's really uh, the basis of that simple algorithm. Um, but it seemed to me that I was actually entering into the way, the ways that our minds worked as humans 150 years ago. Um, so it was a communication between the living and the dead, which I thought was quite interesting between the past and the future. And tell us a bit more about your creative process. Um, I mean, where do you get those ideas from and how do you realize them? So many of your projects are, are so huge in scope um, in terms of spanning time and, and space. I mean, where, where do you start? Um, well, it's interesting because there's been a bit of a shift in my practice. And like so many things, something happened in 2016 to me. Um, it happened to many of my colleagues and friends, and it's happened, I think, to, to many of us and to much of us as a species. I think we're changing fast. Um, and I would, I would say that when I started my practice in 1996, right up until 2016, um, I was consciously looking for primary texts as kind of teachers and mentors. So I would look to a text by Shakespeare or a text by Harold Pinter or a text by T.S. Eliot or a text by Beyonce or a text by Kanye or text by Imogen Heap or a text by any thinker, poet, author, imaginist, visionary that, that I found to, to fill me with possibility. Um, and I didn't feel able to write my own text. Um, 
I felt there was still far too much to learn from the primary text of others. There seemed to be so much extraordinary thought that I was ignorant of. Um, so in answer to your question, most of the ideas of the, the work that you may have seen all up until 2016, all derived from a primary source. Um, and then I learned in 2016 when I was invited to make a work and write the text for it. It was a piece called Mirror Maze, um, and it's gone on to, to lead to, to various other um, sort of solo works and galleries that actually the process when, when you write your own text is not that different. Ideas are still standing on the shoulders of ideas that went before. There's no such thing, in, in my opinion, as an idea in isolation. Um, I learned a lot when working with the extraordinary theoretical physicist Carlo Rivelli, who in his book, The Order of Time, reminds us that the progress of human thought is as much influenced by artists as it is by scientists. And that Seurat was painting with tiny dots just at the time when the scientists were engaged in the nature of the particle qualities and the wave qualities of light. Um, and that uh, Marcel Proust was engaged in the elasticity of time just when some of uh, the theoretical physicists were really engaged profoundly with the nature of time. And that, you know, there's another extraordinary example, which was Leo Zillard, the uh, nuclear scientist who read H.G. Wells's novel in 1913, The World Set Three. And H.G. Wells was, was conjuring something entirely fictional. He was conjuring the idea of nuclear fission. He was conjuring the idea of uh, a nuclear chain reaction and this idea of an impossibly powerful force derived from the forces within nature. Um, it was imaginary work. It was a work of fiction, but Leo Zillard took it to heart and stood at a traffic light in Southampton Row in London. And as he watched the traffic lights change, he had the idea that a chain reaction would be possible. And he stopped what he was doing, which was some work on refrigeration with Einstein. And he dumped that. And he instead uh, devoted his life to, to uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear power. Um, and then he and Einstein ended up writing a letter to Roosevelt saying, listen, if we're getting this far, the enemy, you know, must be developing a nuclear weapon. Uh, and that led directly to the onset of the Manhattan Project and the development of the atomic bomb, which then was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it's just one example of how fiction can drive our thinking forwards as fast as, um, or certainly in coherence and collaboration with, uh, with science. Fantastic. And, and you do a lot of design for concerts and theatre, which I imagine many people in the audience will have seen uh, your work as well. How, how does that experience inform your approach as an artist and a designer, the, that large scale live performance um, and seeing the audience respond to that? I mean, I think the first thing to say about that strand of my practice of designing for large scale mass gatherings and pop concerts is, as you know, it's currently temporarily extinct. Um, so it's become even more precious to me um, for its, you know, ever growing rarity each day. It seems more precious and rare that we ever did that. Right. The fact that we ever sat in Paris with 100,000 people, you know, singing formation album with with Beyonce. That now seems kind of otherworldly, doesn't it? That we sang, you know, these songs together, crunched together in these huge outdoor stadia. Um, it seems mythical now. It seems like something we'll look back on as though that's something they used to do. Um, it has a massive bearing on my whole practice because there's nothing like that power of communal energy of everybody faced in the same direction, everybody willing every atom of their body to hit the same notes. Um, and yet each person bringing their own very personal connection to each particular song. You know, each person's... Uh, identification with each note and each lyric uh, comes from their own personal histories that are unknowable to anyone else in that crowd. So it's at once incredibly private, personal and intimate. Like no one knows the kiss you had to that song or the wedding dance you did to that or your grandmother who died or whatever happened. No, nobody knows that except you. And yet you're all doing something so, you know, outward facing and communal together. Um, and, and, it, and it's a part of us as a species 
um, that we're in danger of losing if we don't find a brilliant way to keep it alive during this period of its temporary extinction. That's what a lot of my focus is on at the moment. And you mentioned, obviously, things have had to change this year. How has COVID affected your practice? Well, that strand of the practice is not happening. You know, there's a lot of other, mercifully, a lot of other aspects of the practice that, um, you know, are getting richer and richer. But that strand of gathering together in theatre or in a arena or in a stadium or anywhere, any kind of mass gathering is clearly stopped. Um, and the big question I'm being asked by everybody, I mean, because musicians still are making music, they still want to present it to their fans, they still want to perform it, they still want to offer a visual counterpart to it. Um, there's a limit to how many bedroom performances one can do. Um, of course, there's the beautiful new XR technology, but quite soon there'll be a limit to, to you know, specific ways of using that. So it's an exciting new technique that we're, we'll be exploring in more and more detail, I think. Um, but yeah, the, the practice has changed beyond recognition in the space of seven or eight months, for sure. Do you think there'll be sort of any long term learnings from this period that you might carry forward? Oh, I think absolutely. I totally agree with that. I think um, I think it's not just my practice where the learnings will be. It'll be us as a species. And my big thought about this, it's coming into sort of shape the longer the months go on, is I think it gives us an opportunity to analyse what is it about what we used to do that we most miss, right? What was really important about it? Why did it matter? Why, why was it ever relevant to gather together what was it about it and and the person I've said this in a few talks actually so I sorry to repeat myself but there's really the best answer has come from Akram Khan the wonderful choreographer who when I asked him and I said what are you most um grieving during this period uh of temporary extinction he said it's the quality of time passing when I perform, the quality of time passing when I observe and engage in a performance. And he reminded me that, of course, digital time and mechanical time are incredibly recent uh, phenomena to our species, right? The last kind of five minutes in terms of the existence of the 73 millennia of our existence. Um, and in, in all pre 19th century uh, or even 18th century uh, time, we would have been governed by different types of timekeeping and storytelling. Uh, you know, uh, parallel engagement in in attention to narrative um, and attention to music is a different way to tell the time. You know, t music literally beats out time by a different rhythm. It doesn't stick with the seconds and the minutes of the clock, right? Um, so I, that's one of the things I've singled out as being really important and being something that if we don't find a way to release ourselves from digital and mechanical means of timekeeping by these sort of daily interactions with uh, culture, we may find that we do change as a species, let alone my practice. <laughs> the actual species will evolve, you know, and change because one of the other things we've been looking at a lot is the, the feedback loops between the things we design and the way that the things we design redesign us, right? There's a wonderful book which has become very influential to me um, called Are We Human?, by the design philosophers from MIT, uh, Beatrice Colomina and Mark Wigley. Um, and they present a really compelling case for the feedback loop that human beings design flints, the flints redesign the hands of the humans, human beings design smartphones, the smartphones entirely redesign our social, cultural, physiological, everything about us is being redesigned by our engagement with these objects. Um, and that's something that, you know, we can stand by and, you know, be complicit in and be subsumed in, uh, or we can really try and understand, observe, and have some agency in. And I and I feel the latter is the more appropriate response, really. Great. It'll be interesting to see where we end up. Um, I think it is a, a huge moment of adaptation, as you say. Um, now, you've yeah. got some really exciting things coming up. Um, you're designing the UK Pavilion at the 2021 World Expo, which you talked a little bit about earlier. And you're also the artistic director of the 2021 London Design Biennale. Uh, what can we expect? Well, I think the big questions we're asking at the London Design Biennale um, are, how do we as designers 
uh, who makes stuff, how do we account for the stuff that we make and how do we actually justify its existence? You know, we, we have so many design biennials, so many design fairs, um, you know, there's a plethora of them all around the planet. Um, how do we really justify even the World Expo, to be honest? You know, it's a lot of materials, it's a lot of concrete, it's a lot of steel, it's a lot of plastic, it's a lot of airfares, it's a lot of stuff, right? How do we really justify its existence? What's it really doing? Um, and I guess the answer that we, we have to look at is nothing should really be there um, in any of these design fairs unless it's genuinely communicating ideas that are going to outweigh the carbon impra- impact of the materials that went into producing it, right? So that's a piece of maths you have to do. So, okay, well, I use these materials, but the message is so, you know, worthwhile. It's so great in its value of how it shifts perspective that it's worthwhile, the other thing I think we're asking ourselves more and more, I was on a, um, a Zoom call with all the set designers. Uh, there's a wonderful collective they form called Scene Change. And a, a group of them, there were some from Philippines, from Colombia, from all over the world, the set designers are gathering on these weekly calls. And a, le- a group of them from America have begun to suggest that maybe once set design reemerges from hibernation, if it does, which we, we hope it will, Perhaps there'll be no longer an acceptance of making set designs out of virgin materials. Perhaps it'll just no longer be acceptable, you know, in the way that smoking in pubs isn't acceptable, right? Perhaps it'll just be only use materials that have already had a life, only use materials that uh, are going to have another life, you know? And perhaps if we start with set design and then we move on to architecture, we move on to art, you know, into construction in general, you know, maybe that's the kind of thing this pause for thought could, could influence. So the, yeah, the London Design Biennale will, will really be looking uh, in detail at that. Now it's in June. So June, when we were looking last June, felt like, you know, <laughs> it felt like one thing. June, when I'm looking at it through the barrel of now, uh, June still feels, you know, that, that the presence of the London Design Biennale will be a combination of small numbers visiting locally, physically, hopefully with some on-site testing uh, and some very safe provision. Um, And it will also, as you mentioned earlier, need to have learned from this process and it'll need to have a global digital reach. And I don't think any of the practices in which I work will reopen without that global digital reach considered. You know, everything will open in a small, local, physical way. Um, and then it will communicate to the wider audience through digital means, hopefully with more and more um, imaginative use of the technology available. Well, we look forward to joining you in whatever format uh, we're able to when that happens. Thanks so much for joining us, Ez. You're so welcome. That was fun. Thank you so much, Vicky.